Um, I, my name is Francisco Nunez, and um, I'm a medical physics training. I actually spent most of my time working for uh, Global Physics Solutions, which is now Landauer Medical Physics, um, as a clinical physicist. And um, I've been with Phillips for the last three months or so. And um, so they've asked me to, to uh, give this presentation. And uh, so today what I'm going to do is uh, adaptive radiation. Thing. And the question we pose is, is it now feasible to move the theories of adaptive radiation therapy to routine clinical practice for any radiation oncology center? So what I want to start out with is I'll, I'll kind of give you an overview of what we're um, First of all, I'm going to go over three uh, academic cases, sort of give the academic justification for adaptive planning and why it's done. And, and then I want to go that into some clinical examples. You know, we can start off with the academic reasons. This can affect us clinically. Is this something that we can actually use? So I want to give some examples of that, right? Um, then we'll go into the obvious question of why aren't we doing it at all or, or why aren't we doing it enough? And, you know, the answers vary on that. But, you know, people say it takes too long to work, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, I'd like to get into how we do it within our tool, within Pinnacle. Um, so here's our first study. Um, this was do, do, done by Kuwen Widal. Um, and what they did is a retrospective study of 11 patients with locally advanced head and neck cancer. And it's, this was a retrospective study um, because the tools that the study was done um, were, were such that it's a very consuming process. And it still is for most clinics, a very time consuming process to go through and replan patients. So doing it retrospectively is really one of the only ways that they could have done it. And what they found was those 11 patients, when they went back and replanned them, they could improve dose by up to 10% due to replanning. And for consistency, the same IMRT objectives were used for all subsequent plans. So what that means is they did several replans, um, but they just IMRT objectives for each one of the replans. So they did no kind of fine-tuning of the optimization, which could have actually made, which could have provided superior results in this case. Um, one of the things, the more frequently they could replan, the more parotid sparing that they could get. And another interesting thing to note is that the sparing of the parotid is greatest when the plan could be implemented in the same week. So when they put it together, um, they had actually started with the assumption they would no change, implement that, or repatient and implement that following week to allow time for replanning. When they changed that as made it so that the plan could be implemented in the same week, they found greater sparing of the parotids. So here a slide, a little picture from that particular study of one patient, and we can see that on the left-hand side, this is a slice of that patient's CT at week six. And what we can see, those are the original contours are on that slice. So again, this is weeks with the original contours on it on the left-hand side. And we can see that the contours are actually out in space, particularly for, for the parotids. The parotids obviously changed significantly in size over the course of treatment. Um, so on the right hand, we see that same slice of CT uh, at week six with the contours did. So we can see that this patient did indeed change quite a bit over time. They also have a table in this particular that shows that really the, the CT2 left parotid and right parotid all changed during the course of treatment week by week. And in fact, um, it was interesting to note that on when CTV2 was actually larger uh, than on week zero. So the, the tumor had actually increased in size or the, or the treatment volume had actually increased in size from week zero to one. In this case, in fact, uh, the, the treatment, something interesting to note that, the, that it actually did increase and could be a potential miss if it's don't watch closely. 
Um, the next um, was done by Peter on et al. Uh, and the 23 head and neck patients. For those 23 head and neck, they did th three rescans during the treatment. So it was at fractions 11, 22, and 33. What they found was of those 23, 15 required a replan. And the reasons included both target homogeneity issues and improved OAR sparing. Furthermore, overdose source organs included the parotids, mandible, spinal cord, brainstem. These are all the reasons for which we're already doing IMRT. So basically, all the reasons for which we're doing IMRT are also all the reasons for which they needed to replan. It really spanned all of the organs that we're talking about and as well as donating. So one interesting point of the study was they were really trying to come up with an algorithm for replanning. So what that means is they were trying to find out um, if they could correlate one bull to the need for a replan. For example, if a patient loses, say, 20% of their body weight, can we say that if a patient loses percent of their body weight, we should then trigger the need for a replan or a reassessment of that patient's plan? Or if a patient decreases by, say, 2 cm in circumference, does that trigger the need to replan? And what they found is really couldn't find a single variable that could be correlated to the need for a replan. So what that means is the only way to figure out patient, according to the, the only way for a patient to, to know whether a patient needs a replan is to actually do recalculation and reassessment and see if that patient needs a replan. There is no shortcut algorithm. There's no rule of thumb that you can follow. And that point. So there may be some case where we would know right away in, in cases of extreme weight loss, like our friend Jared here. But for the most part, we just need to do it. So this third study um, was actually a pretty elegantly executed. And something they, from what I've found, are doing a little bit more commonly in Europe. In this case, what they took 20 patients whom they selected for adaptive radiotherapy of the bladder. Now, they created three degrees, and if you can see on the screen, we have uh, a blue, red, and a green PTV. Those PTVs were created so that on the day of treatment, when they did their PT of the patient, they could choose a plan that corresponded to any one of those three P PTVs and then applied that plan. So from the from data that they've looked at in the past, they've found that the, the bladder expands more anteriorly and superiorly. Um, that, that's, the, uh, that's where the margin of error is the greatest, is in the, in, in the anterior and superior directions. So the red con example, which is slightly larger than the blue, is 5 millimeters larger anteriorly and 5 millimeters larger superiorly than the blue. And again, the green is 5 millimeters larger anteriorly and superiorly than the red. What they found was adapting the plan showed significant sparing of the small bowel. However, in that LA9 study, um, they found that 5% of these patients needed a full replan systematic changes in the bladder filling. So even though they had this carefully designed study, which really seemed to work around these adapt of issues, they still needed to go back on 25% of the patients and replan from scratch. So now it's time for us to take a quick audience poll. Um, okay, this is Andy Fuller. I'm going to launch the uh, poll here. So um, I think if I do this right, uh, hopefully you guys can uh, click on the screen and uh, answer these polls. Is the first question, are you currently doing adaptive planning in your clinic? Let's see what else is coming in right now. Okay. It looks like it's a lot more out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And in follow-up, we'd just like to ask one other question here. So bear with me. I'm just going to close that and open the second question. 
So if you answer no, please answer the, the follow-up question. Did it show up? Yeah, it looks like the answers are coming out to about 53% because it's too time consuming. Mm -hmm. uh, about 20% saying it's not necessary. Oh, there it is. About nine too much work and 12% regarding reinvestment. Sure, sure. So, no, those are good, those are good answers. So, okay, great. So, I wanted to go in now to some clinical examples of replanning. It's of adaptive planning, right? And it sounds like a lot of people say they're not doing adaptive planning. So, I wanted to pose these questions. Uh, and I guess at this point, this is rhetorical, but um, how often where a physician states, I want to treat this patient, for example, to 5,430 fractions, and we're going to scan at 3,600 centigrade. Um, and so they write prescription right from day one, right? Or how many had it happen where therapists note during the course of treatment that a patient's mask just doesn't fit them anymore uh, for a head and neck patient. Uh, they're neck tumor has de-sized significantly or they've lost some weight and they come back and say we need to remake the mask so that this patient doesn't move around and as a result we'll probably have to replan this patient. Or how about the patient seat just does not match planning CT well. Right? Or patient, I'm sorry, the patient setup does not match the planning CT well. Sometimes the patient comes in for their initial CT, when it comes time for them to get treated on the patient on the table, they can't maintain that setup the entire treatment, or even on the first fraction. Or the last is the patient relaxes during the course of treatment. So I often therapists said, you know, the patient came in, they were all nervous, maybe their butt cheeks were clenched as they're laying on the table. Over the course of treatment, they get a little more relaxed. They start joking around with the therapist as they're walking into the room, and they're just much more comfortable as they get onto the table. In any case, I, I, the majority of the centers have had to replan for for all the reasons, for one or all of those reasons. Um, and if planning, for example, to match um, because a mask doesn't work, doesn't fit anymore, or to adapt to the fact that the patient's anatomy is changing in a lung, that is, by definition, an adaptive plan. Anytime we're adapting to a patient's changing anatomy or cha a patient's changing, changing, we are doing an adaptive plan. So that the process is very time consuming, right? So tip, what ends up happening is for example, in the case where the mask is getting loose on a patient, and we decide to replan, we'll base in the patient again and um, start a treatment plan from scratch. Sometimes you can bring that scan into the treatment planning system, copy the old plan onto the new, and if you have in-house script, make that process a little bit simpler. But basically, it's starting the plan from scratch, right? So what we have within our, what we have as a tool within Pinnacle now is the ability to automate some of the most time consuming portions of that work. So in this case, take the CBCT scan from treatment or a new scan, bring everything, automate steps and calculate those and evaluate the plan. Now a point out slide that we have two separate paths of evaluation. On the top, we show the CBCT scan, and on the bottom, we actually show a new CT scan. So 
for the purposes of reevaluating a plan, it's actually perfectly acceptable to use your comb beam CT from treatment. That'll streamline the process. You can get a quick assessment of where you are today and how you plan um, how to execute it on this pain, changing patient's anatomy, right? Um, now, if you decide to replan, um, most commonly people would actually do a CT sim. If you decide to use a CBCT scan on a new plan, you'd probably you would need it as a site physics team with your site physics team if you're comfortable with the CT to density curves on your on your combi team. But with processes, this is what can help improve the workflow. We can spend less time evaluating these patient changes. We want to offer a tool that uh, that gives us fast assessment abilities, the, the ability to analyze the dose to the tumor today, and to adapt and recreate the plan with limited intervention if necessary. The next thing these tools can, can allow us to improve patient care. If we have a truly automated tool, we can change the plans more frequently, if that's what's best for the patient, right? We can also rapidly deploy those plan changes. Remember when I was talking about in the studies, the more quickly we can deploy those plan changes, they found that when they could deploy it the same week as opposed to the following week, um, they had improved results. Having a more automated, more streamlined tool can offer us that, right? Finally, this having a automated tool can allow us to come up with a prospective strategy treatments. So no longer do we have to be reactive, no longer do we have to wait until a patient's mask just doesn't fit and it's obvious to everybody um, and maybe they're moving around a lot inside of there. We can set up a strategy by at say fraction 10, 20, and 30, a fraction every fifth fraction or however often you feel comfortable, you can do evaluation of that patient's plan and decide and, and be up with things being reactive. So that would be a Again, an example of a prospective strategy as, a, as opposed to a reactive strategy. The other thing for us is the, the ability to greatly simplify the retreatment process. We can bring in the beams from the old plan and combine them on the new plan and we can look for areas of, of overlap. For example, spine, spine patients. How does this process work? For original plan, and if you're a pinnacle user, this screen will look somewhat familiar to you, right? We would select the source plan, select the target image set, and create the new. So what we're doing is we're copying the plan from the original, we're copying the plan to the new CT, and we simply create Click Create New. What what tabulately is the plan parameters are copied from the old image set to the new image set, and that thing gets copied over, including beams, ROI or your contours, points of interest, prescriptions, and IMRT object. Everything is copied over to this new target image set. automatic image registration takes place in the background, right? The beam plate and, and the ROIs are propagated. So the first step automatic registration is a rigid registration. In the rigid registration, the, the two data are, are fused there with, a, with a common rigid registration to get the, the, to get the beam plates not to the new data set. Once that once that's done, we move into the deformable registration phase of this. And again, this is all happening behind the scenes. This deformable registration, the purpose of it is to propagate the ROIs to the new data set. It takes our contours from the old data set based on the patient changes that it, it, it deforms ROIs to the new data set. After that process is over, we can directly go in and start 
evaluating the quality of the fusion, evaluating our new ROIs. We can start to visit the impact weight loss of the patient or whatever anatomical changes on the patient in the record viewer. In this case, we can see that the contours are no longer apl applicable on the new image set. This matches pretty well with the study that we, that we looked at earlier with the parotids changing in size greatly. And in this case, the tumor as well changed in size. And it's interesting to hear that um, Dostin is something we'd want to be very careful about. There are there are some soft there is some software that handles dose deformation, but in this case we'd really want to be careful about looking at that um, because it's in voxels. So on the on the left hand side, for example, we have voxels of tissue that do not exist on the right hand side. So if you were using some sort of third party dose deformation tool, you'd want to make it make sense. And if you had say a thousand voxels of tissue on one on one side and only six hundred voxels of tissue on the on the right side, where does that dose go, right? It those are no longer there. So dose deformation is something you take with a grain of salt. So it would be something we'd watch out for in the, in the, if we were using some party tool for that kind of evaluation. The next is visualize the impact of weight loss using the BEV. Now in this case we can actually see on the right hand side that the beam port does not act the tumor and it will need to be readjusted. We can simply calculate the plan. Again, everything's been brought over from the old plan. So all we need to do once the fusion's been done, once the ROIs have been propagated, is simply hit recalculate. Recalculate in this case shows us that the solid line, which is the DVA tumor or of the PTV, does not match up with what was originally being accomplished in that plan. So in this case, we may want to re-optimize. which I'm showing on this slide. Now again, even our IMRT objective is over. So we wouldn't have start from scratch creating IMRT objectives. We can simply reset them and start the optimization. Now at this time, if we want to further improve the plan, we can of course modify those, modify those objectives a little bit. But we have a starting point. We don't need to start from scratch to do this optimization. Finally, this reoptimization will update our MLC positions and monitor units. The new MLC segments are now a data image set, and we can see that what was once missing on the left-hand side is now being encompassed by the MLC port. And evaluate these new DVH lines. And we can see that we now have much better coverage and it matches what the physician's original intent for that place much better than it than it was upon the first recalculation. Another rule which is actually new in Pinnacle is we can now mark the efficacy of the course of their treatment. We can we have trending tools for for following the movement of our contour and the the change in volume of our contours over time. So on the left hand is the, the relative centroid position. So th that's the center of our contour of interest. And we can look at any one of our contours for this. Now in this case we can see the X, Y, and Z movements of that contour and we, we can also see the total vector change of that contour. So how much it moves, so, so how much it, uh, in total. Also we can see the change in the total volume over the course of treatment. Now, it's important that in this case, we're actually using only an original CT scan and, and a rescan. However, if we were five different plans, within Pinnacle, we could actually handle this, and we would have five different data points. So you could really see a trending over time with this tool. So 
as I said before, um, and, and I actually talked about in the second study, it, there, what, and what, what is being found is a lot of times it's really difficult to know simply by looking at a patient whether or not a replanning is going to have to occur. So see, for example, on this patient, um, there's a very fast change in this patient's anatomy. That patient's neck has decreased in size. Um, interesting, however, going through this dynamic planning process, again, starting with taking the original skin and copying everything over, which is all done automated within Pinnacle, and hitting recap. We actually see on the right-hand side here the DVHs, the resulting DVHs. In this case, that drastic change of, an, of anatomy, the, the effect is actually not as great as one, of, one would have suspected. Um, of course, it would be a clinician, the clinician to decide whether or not they wanted to replan. But it's just an example of being able to evaluate this quickly could actually save you time. You could actually prevent yourself from replanning in some cases if you have something to, to improve the need of evaluation. So, find what, what, we, what this tool allows us to do is efficiently recalculate and, and or, well, re efficiently recalculate and assess those effects of anatomical just during the patient, during the patient's treatment. So if the patient changes in some way, we have now a much easier way of recalculating and assessing whether that makes a detrimental dosimetric effect. Uh, we can now adapt the plan to with much with limited user intervention and track the patient's over. No, noting the changes in volume and notice in position of those of the structures that we're concerned about. Also, we have to, a, to embark on a prospective of retreatment if that's what we're interested in doing. And one extra benefit of it is being able to have enhanced targeting on patients requiring retreatment. So if, if a patient was to your center and has now come in for a retreatment and you want to make sure that you're fields aren't overlap spine, they can greatly reduce the amount of time spent on that. I know that's something that can take a long time. So here are my references, and I guess now I'm ready for um, Andy Fuller to give you sort of an, an overview on, um, on Pinnacle and Thanks, Francisco. Um, I'll just uh, take over here. Presentation. Okay, you can see my screen. Um, so, uh, just before I get started on hit on this, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, update on, um, you know, Pinnacle 9.6 and some of the features that we've uh, just introduced. Um, but um, if uh, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to to pose um, to uh, myself or Francisco, uh, please enter those in the question window, and uh, we'll have a Q and A session um, toward the end of the um, session here, and we'll we'll try to answer as many of those as possible. Okay, um, let me uh, let me tell you a bit about um, our recent introductions in Pinnacle. So uh, as uh, Francisco has been talking about uh, a lot of information on the uh, dynamic planning software, and that was introduced with Pinnacle 9.6. Actually, there's been a few uh, questions coming in um, regarding which version of um, Pinnacle this uh, software capability is available in. It is an option for Pinnacle 9.6, which was released um, at the beginning of this year, uh, just around March time frame. So Pinnacle 9.6 includes the dynamic planning capability. Uh, it's an option for that software. There's also a couple other um, elements of 9.6 that I wanted to um, tell you about, um, and that features, you know, to just um, kind of remind you of some some things that have been introduced in Pinnacle recently, which uh, you may or may not be aware of. So, um, first of all, 
in 96 we are flattening filter free support and then there's a number of other customer driven enhancements and improvements that I'll mention briefly. So um, Francisco's shared a lot of information um, regarding uh, dynamic planning. Um, as I say that's available with 96 uh, but it really does you know kind of facilitate this whole workflow of um, enabling assessment as quickly as possible, automating replanning should you choose to do that. Um, there's also some neat um, uh, features in your treatment plans over time. We have a nice feature for um, kind of a timeline based uh, approach to the problem so you can basically track um, you know uh, updated plan uh, aligned with new image sets that you've used um, which really kind of makes this whole process much more straightforward. And then finally, you know, um, dynamic planning uh, is not only for adaptive radiation therapy, um, you can also use it very uh, constructively in retreatment scenarios, um, which I, you know, obviously even uh, in the majority of clinics, if, if you're not yet uh, doing adaptive radiation therapy, you probably get a number of uh, retreatment cases coming through the door. Um, and dynamic planning can really help with that by bringing the, uh, a previous plan um, forward to your uh, current image set for a given patient. So planning, we're very pleased with that software and uh, like I say, it was introduced in uh, March with Pinnacle 9.6. In addition, uh, in Pinnacle 9.6, um, we have uh, enabled uh, flattening filter free support uh, for both Varian and Electa Linux. Um, Obviously, this is, a, this is a capability that has uh, gained a lot of traction uh, in the marketplace, um, you know, with the introduction on the um, variant systems first and now the Electra uh, systems with the Versa HD and the Agility Head. Um, and I'll be the constant drive to, um, you know, shortment times uh, is a big deal and, and definitely enabled by flattening filter free. Um, from the pinnacle perspective, um, we were always able to uh, model the flattening filter-free beam. What we added in 9.6 was the correlation and the kind of automatic triggering of the flattening filter-free DICOM tags, uh, such that when you create a, a beam um, that is flattening filter-free in Pinnacle, when you expand, the, the correct tag accompanies it, and um, you know that that all works very seamlessly uh, from then on. Um, so like I say, flattening filter free uh, is uh, supported now in Pinnacle for uh, all of the variant units that support it, the TrueBeam, the Trilogy, uh, and also Linux, the Versa HD, and other Linux that are equipped with Agility and the flattening filter free option. A couple of uh, features that uh, we've added to Pinnacle in the 9.6 release. Um, first of all, we are now able to uh, import RT dose from other uh, planning systems, so um, you know, it could be Eclipse, could be a thermotherapy plan or a CyberKnife, anything like that. Um, you know, anything that uh, can export the RT uh, plan object with the summation type of plan, we can import. So that's a nice capability in in Pinnacle. Um, we can also do a side by side comparison, as you see in the uh, in the display there. Uh, we simulate dose in, in Pinnacle 9.6. Um, if, if you have the dynamic planning license, you can accumulate the uh, doses from, um, you know, third-party dose sorts, as I mentioned before. Um, kind of adds to that functionality. And um, just very briefly, I'll, I'll just uh, remind you, um, those, those uh, Pinnacle users out there, a couple of other features that we've had for a, for a, a slightly longer time now, but I still think. Uh, worth bringing to your attention. Um, so uh, the first of those is segmentation with SPICE software. This has been available since Pinnacle 9.4 actually, which was um, introduced last year. Um, but I um, mention this because uh, you know, I think the majority of uh, customers in the install base for Pinnacle are kind of running 9.2, maybe 9.0. Um, so SPICE is available um, in 9.6 as well. Uh, it really does kind of um, help to uh, address the, the bottleneck of contouring which you know remains a significant problem for most clinics. Um, 
and you know, no auto uh, solution is perfect, but uh, certainly uh, Spice has a, a great feature set to get you up and running quickly, get your uh, initial contouring done in a very expedient fashion, working in the background, um, you know, uh, while you work on other things, so you don't even have to worry about, um, you know, watching this take place. Uh, you can simply kick off the auto contouring, go go ahead and work on a, uh, another plan or some pinnacle, and then you, you get a notification when the auto contouring is complete, and then you can basically go through and uh, you know review those contours um, and um, and edit them as you need to. But um, like I say, solution for every single problem in the contouring world, but definitely um, you know something that gives you a good head start and allows you to make prog progress and uh, on, on contouring pretty efficiently. Finally, uh, in terms of features, I just thought I'd mention our SmartArc software. Um, this has been available for a while now. We introduced it with Pinnacle 9.0 and updated it with 9.2. Um, but uh, you know, I think it's worth mentioning um, just because if you if you haven't yet made the jump to um, VMAT planning or uh, you know, kind of operational delivery. Um, you can do that with uh, SmartArc for Pinnacle, and uh, it's uh, compatible with both Varian and Alexa Linux. We do support um, a constant dose rate uh, delivery mode for SmartArc. Um, that can um, save you some money on your Linux upgrades uh, if, if um, that's of interest to you. And um, you know we've we've had really good feedback on the uh, on the SmartArc software. And uh, so, like I say, uh, as as uh, another option uh, to Pinnacle customers in the field, this is worthy of consideration. Uh, of platform support, Pinnacle 9.6 is uh, compatible with all of our current uh, Pinnacle platforms. Um, that's our 8.10x uh, workstations and server systems, um, our professional system, um, which um, you know, it's really gained some field, and and uh, you know, thanks to all of you that have uh, made this the jump to professional. It's a it's a valuable system, and uh, I know that people are uh, getting the most out of that that new uh, format. And uh, also with our smart enterprise system, which is more of our kind of um, multiple clean enterprise solution um, hardware platform. Uh, I will just mention very briefly that our older Spark based. Uh, workstation systems are not supported by Pinnacle 9.6. In fact, that's been the case since 9.4. So um, do do bear that in mind. But um, based on all of our uh, current hardware platforms, those that have not been uh, you know uh, retired, Spark workstations have um, 9.6 is fully compatible with with all of those platforms. Um, for any additional information, I just point to some of the resources available. Um, for for anyone, whether you're a Philips customer or not, you can take a look at um, philips.com forward slash forward slash excuse me dynamic planning um, to to take a look at um, you know the spec sheets and the uh, various information related to our dynamic planning um, uh, soft um, for uh, customers uh, of Pinnacle. We have um, release notes and computer-based training that are available for um, for uh, both 9.6 dynamic planning and auto segmentation with Spice, and um, so make uh, a number of um, resources available for our customers, um, such as application notes and physics support um, uh, elements that are through Incenter, which is uh, you know a, a, a resource you get uh, access to by being a registered Philips customer. Okay, so um, with that, I think what we'll do is addition to um, a Q&A session. Francisco, are you still there? Can you still hear me okay? Okay, <laughs> there you go, now he's unmuted. <laughs> yep. All right, so let's see. Um, I'm just gonna step through some chat questions here and um, Thanks to everyone for the, the questions that have been coming in. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll try our best. And if not, we'll follow up uh, afterwards. So um, one, one question, Francisco, that was asked was um, related to the on 
cone beam CT. Question one, do you have a calibrated CT to density table for the CBCT? And is this table available in Pinnacle as per Sure. No, and that's that's a good question. And um, the the way pinnacle is you can use any CT that you have a density table for. You can use to calculate dose on it. So, but it, it it's a bit unconventional to use a CBCT um, to calculate dose if you're going to then modify the plan. And and deliver based on that CBCT. So what I mean is, um, so a CBCT or CT, right? So we can we can take that in and recompute dose on it if we have a CT density curve for our CBCT, or you can do density overrides for the structures within there. Um, but if you want to take it the next and actually take that CBCT and plan on it and and plan a deliverable plan based on that. You really want to work with your site physics to make sure that you're comfortable with your CT tables for your linear accelerator. Um, there are confl conflicting research on that whether that whether that um, whether the CT table coming from uh, a cone beam CT is stable. Um, but in answer, to, um, any CT that has a density table associated with it can be used to calculate in Pinnacle. Hopefully that's using. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, here's another question um, regarding the dynamic planning software and the, the area of um, ROI propagation. And the question is: Are propagated ROIs done to the nearest voxel on the new data set? Is it here? Yeah. Okay. If, um, if you can answer it. Are they just voxel on the new data set? Um, yeah, I think maybe I should jump in there. I mean, basically what yeah. we're doing is a, a deformable image registration in the background. And um, we're mapping the, um, you know, obviously we're mapping the voxels in the original image to the new image uh, to determine uh, the movement of the ROIs. Now, as uh, Francisco mentioned during the presentation, the one piece that we've uh, really exposed in terms of the deformable image registration is the movement of those contours. So uh, I don't think it's really straightforward to say, you know, is it done to the nearest voxel, but basically we're, we're mapping the voxels from one image set to another, and then we're moving the ROIs uh, according to that. And and then you have the ability to, to go through and check the ROIs, the propagated ROIs in the new data set, make sure that you agree with that um, uh, uh, propagation, and then you can go ahead and, and recalculate based on, on that new image set. So hopefully that, that kind of answers the question. It's, it's not really a nearest voxel thing. It's really based on the whole deformable image registration that happens in the background. Um, but you do have the, the ability to step through and look look at all of those contours and make sure that you agree with the results of that deformation, basically. That, that makes sense, Francisco? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Another question, um, Francisco, you might want to answer this one, is when you're recalculating the original plan on the new data set, um, are you doing it with fixed MUs? Yes, absolutely. So, so the original plan that's being calculated on the new data set is um, the exact plan that's being delivered. So, so no changes are made whatsoever um, because the idea is that we want to reassess how is what we're delivering today, um, how, how translate to the new patient's anatomy, and are there are there problems with that delivery? So, yeah, in answer to your question, it is the exact plan that we had before is first recalculated on the new data set before any changes are made. Okay. Um, okay, I'm getting lots of questions in now, so I'm just trying to find um, anything that I can... Um... You know, okay, so I see one here that... Here. 
Oh, go ahead. You, you know, it's it, it just one that kind of sticks out to me. Uh, that it says, are your hospital's physicians group willing to do multiple plans even if they cannot be charged? That, that it's kind of interesting. Yeah. That, that one sticks out to me because, interestingly, one of the places, or some of the users that we have talked to that are most interested in this tool are uh, Europeans, right, who are much less likely to get any kind of extra reimbursement. Um, but if that is done, you can typically justify for the for the re, for the extra work. Yeah, we've certainly um, with a number of centers that we've spoken to about this uh, software and this capability. You know, um, what we what we generally hear is that you can get uh, reimbursement isn't a problem if you can prove medical necessity, right? And um, you know, so part of the dynamic planning software in Pinnacle really aims to address the need for documentation and, and uh, demonstration of that medical necessity. So that's something that we focused on in the product and hopefully that will you know, translate to uh, you know, making those uh, services reimbursable. So, um, there's another question here, Francisco, uh, a clinical question which says, uh, asks what causes the parotid shrinkage? Is it dehydration, weight loss, radiation response? What is it? You know, that's a question. Um, I'm not exactly sure clinical reasons for the parotid shrinkage is, um, it, but it is minted over and over again. It's, it's the most commonly documented thing that I saw um, in regards to planning that the, that the parotids do shrink. Um, as far as the clinical reasons for it, I, I honestly can't give them off the top of my head. We're coming up to the top of the hour, so um, we'll make this the last question. And for those of you that submitted additional questions, thanks for those. We'll, we'll try and answer them separately offline. The one final question uh, is, is there a limit as to how many replans you will do during the course of treatment? Uh, no limit uh, that I know of. Um, it would be what uh, is there a physical limit in the software, Andy? No, there's no physical limit. Yeah, there's no physical limit. So yeah, it would, yeah, it would, there would be a practical limit. So, um, so physically not limited. Um, and I, I think the best answer is you know what what you decide as a clinical team is appropriate. I, I think. It's this is a paradigm for all of us, and um, we do know that plans do need to be adapted during the course of treatment, and I think that's well established. Um, but I think we're still learning as to how often we'll have to do, and having these tools will will help us figure that out and come up with a comprehensive strategy for it. All right, all right. With that, I think we have to wrap up now. Um, uh, I'll transfer control. I'll oh, take it from here, guys. Spencer. All right, I just want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar today. Uh, we do have four more this week. Uh, they are available to members and non-members, so if you do have any colleagues that uh, want to watch them, um, we have plenty of seats. Uh, feel free to register and uh, watch the rest of those this week. Uh, they'll be at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you do have any uh, questions or comments, uh, feel free to email them to the AAMD at medicaldosymmetry.org. There will be a short uh, post-webinar survey uh, that will pop up on your screen after this is over. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback you can give us. Uh, anything else, uh, just let me know. Again, the credits will be available. I'm going to try to get them up uh, within 48 hours. They will be up uh, by Monday next week at the very latest. Uh, but look for those under the online CE Center. Go down to your transcript. Um, and they will populate. The MDCB upload will not be done until next week, um, so they are very different things. This is your AAMD transcript. The MDCB uh, learning plan is different, um, so look for those uh, next week. Um, handouts and the recording will be posted within 48 hours, uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you guys uh, at our other webinars this week. Thank you. That the products do shrink. Um, as far as the clinical reasons for it, I, I honestly can't give them off the top of my head. 
Uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour, so um, we'll make this the last question. And for those of you that submitted additional questions, thanks for those. We'll, we'll try and answer them separately offline. The one final question uh, is, is there a limit as to how many replans you will do during the course of treatment? Uh, no limit uh, that I know of. Um, it would be what uh, is there a physical limit in the software, Andy? No, there's no physical limit. Yeah, there's no physical limit. So yeah, it would, limit. yeah it would, there would be a practical limit. So, um, so physically not limited. Um, and I, I think the best answer is, you know, what what you decide as a clinical team is appropriate. I, I think it's this is a paradigm for all of us, and um, we do know that plans do need to be adapted during the course of treatment, and I think that's well established, um, but I think we're still learning as to how often we'll have to do and having these tools will, will help us figure that out and come up with a comprehensive strategy for it. All right. All right. With that, I think we have to wrap up now. Um, let me, uh, I'll transfer control. Oh, thank you from here, guys. Spencer. I right, just want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar today. Uh, we do have four more this week. Uh, they are available to members and non-members, so if you do have any colleagues that uh, want to watch them, um, we have plenty of seats. Uh, feel free to register and uh, watch the rest of those this week. Uh, they'll be at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you do have any uh, questions or comments, uh, feel free to email them to the AAMD at medicaldissymmetry.org. There will be a short uh, post-webinar survey. Uh, that'll pop up on your screen after this is over. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback you can give us. Uh, anything else, uh, just let me know. Again, the credits will be available. I'm going to try to get them up uh, within 48 hours. They will be up uh, by Monday next week at the very latest. Uh, but look for those under the Online C Center. Go down to your transcript, um, and they will populate. The MDCB upload will not be done until next week. Um, so they are very different things. This is your AAMD transcript. The MDCB uh, learning plan is different. Um, so look for those uh, next week. Um, handouts and the recording will be posted within 48 hours. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you guys uh, at our other webinars this week. Thank you.